It's time for the show about the people and the places of the Carolinas with the occasional visitors. In addition to hosting the award-winning syndicated TV show Life in the Carolinas, Carl White writes a weekly syndicated column and now hosts this weekly show, the Life in the Carolinas podcast. Now you can hear the story about the stories. And now here's your host, Carl White. Welcome to this edition of Life in the Carolinas podcast. And we have a great guest. Heck, they're all great, but Margaret's a little extra great because she's an artist and creative person and a teacher and all sorts of things. Why don't you tell folks who you are, Margaret? I am Margaret Ferguson Carter Martini, who is from Ferguson, born and raised. I have deep roots in Wilkes County and Caldwell County as well. I am a retired art educator. I run a private art school in Lenore. I'm a painter, and suddenly I ended up owning Whippoorwill Academy and Village when my mother passed away, which was something I thought I was going to help her with, but I ended up owning it. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell. I love history, and I love art. Well, it sounds to me like that as people get to know you over the next half hour, they're going to find out that your life is and the, 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 the facets of your life are just as complicated as your name, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is wonderful. Your mother, Edith Carter, was someone that was kind to me in the show, I think about 10, 11 years ago when I first met her at Whippoorwill Academy. I was fascinated with this piece of land that had been curated in such a way to, to excite people about learning. Was her influence always around education? My mother was a dynamo. Um, as my granddaughter would say, she was a goer woman. And she, uh, uh, she was such an interesting person in so many ways. I mean, she studied in schools from Dallas to New York City to what was RPI and now is VCU for art. She was a passionate artist. She started Art in the Park and Blowing Rock, which my sister and I helped her with for 30 years. We, uh, she was an interesting person. She, uh, my father wouldn't leave the farm because he, you never know if an animal's going to have, give birth to a cow or right. the crops or whatever. But mom would take us camping and go to other states just by herself, which not many women of her age would have done something like that. But she didn't hesitate. My mother taught at at a, at a rival school to a high school where I was teaching, we both taught the same subject. And uh, I would tell the kids, if you're going to move over to that school, you better watch out. That woman needs razor blades for breakfast. She's, you know, <laughs> so then she would do the same back to me. And if I had supplies she needed, right. we'd trade off. And she was, she was like a colleague also, as well as a mom. And uh, she was very insistent that we appreciate the area that we lived and that we mm -hmm. know our family. Uh, she didn't hesitate to drive to other states for us to visit relatives, to get to know them, and to have them come down. And so she really had it ingrained in us, the importance of family and also the importance of history. Why was she that way? What, what was it in, in her life and with her parents, why did she take this approach on life? Her father was T.W. Ferguson, who was a historian also. Okay. My grandmother Ferguson never, ever spoke of her family, but Granddaddy Ferguson told stories and made sure that we all knew about the local history and the importance of the family farm. The family farm has been in my family since the 1700s, and I don't take that for granted. I feel like we are stewards only, that if we can... Uh, enable other people to enjoy the land then by all means and mom was insistent before she died she was one of the things she was most proud of was that she put our family land into a land trust so that it could never be developed and uh and my husband and i have done the same as my sister has with uh with each of our properties that we've gotten um through our inheritance so the land that you grew up on mm -hmm. is protected absolutely for the future our kids can't develop it. Wah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? Would you, what? Our, uh, you know, my daughter totally appreciates what we've done. And, mm -hmm. um, and my husband was 100% for it as well. He felt like the family legacy was important. And the bad thing is, is that we become everybody's view. So I'm sure that we've increased the value of land around our property. <laughs> but, right, uh, right. but we feel real strongly about um, 
preserving the land and places for animals to live. I mean, where are they sure. going to go once everything's developed? Right. When you when you get a phone call and and it's a reporter or someone doing a story and <clears throat> hey Margaret, could you in a nutshell, what do you do? You've kind of given us that. Now let's break all that down and talk about it. Well, when the reporter calls, I usually expect that it's about Whippoorwill. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm happy to oblige and talk to them about that. Um, for me, my I ended up in art as well as my mother. And I was making a decision between being a writer or being an artist. And I realized when my parents would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and tell me it was time to quit painting and go to bed, <laughs> then uh, I thought, well, maybe this is the direction right. I'm supposed to go. I got my um, my art education degree at Appalachian State University, and I got my Master of Fine Arts in Painting at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, I served on the board there for a while, an advisory board at SCAD. I'm also involved with many different historic Groups, um, one being the Daniel Boone uh, Historic Trail Group. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really believe in them and what they're doing and the importance of the history of our of our area. Um, but I taught art for years, and from from middle school to high school to Appalachian State University. And the beauty of that is, is that so many of my kids, and I still feel like they're my children, have come back to help me at the village. Oh, that's great. They are. We've got um, we've got several on our board of directors at Whippoorwill that were my students. Right. We just have. I just have a really close relationship with my former students. When you walked into the studio <clears throat> this morning, you looked at the wall and you said, "Hey." I see you have some work by Charlie Fry. And I said, sure, we love Charlie Fry and love his work. To which you said... Charlie's always said that I influenced him in getting his start in art. And um, he would come down to my room when I was teaching the kids and he'd say, what are you doing and how did you do it? Being artists, we share. We don't keep the, the knowledge and the information to ourselves. That's the important thing in being a teacher and being an artist, that you share what you know. Right. And you hope that it enlightens somebody else and it brings a better quality to their lives. And I felt like that's what happened with my students. From your perspective, you know, your gut feeling of why art is so important. Why is it important that you do what you do? Well, my art takes many different directions, and mm-hmm. some of my art is political, and it has been since I was in high school. Okay. I started a series of rat trap portraits uh, a few years ago with people that said unbelievably offensive things, and many of them were our leaders in our in our country. So what I would do is I'd flip the little cheese down on the rat trap and paint in small, small letters what they had said. And then I had a really nice black shadow box type uh, frame done with it. And my mother said, you know, some people are going to be offended by this, but I really believe in what you're doing. She said, (laughs) when it's shown in a gallery, you make sure that they put that quote in larger letters on a title card so that people my age can read it. She said, this is just so important. So I did that. I've done uh, portraits this year of... uh, Uh, Khashoggi, the journalist who was um, brutally killed uh, in Turkey while his fiance waited for him. So I've done some things like that, but I also do some things of beauty that bring me uh, joy. Um, I don't just always hit the the politics, but I think it's important for people to know that art can be much more than about something beautiful. It can really speak thousands of words in an image on what you're trying to say. Uh, So in essence, you're, you're, you're stirring the emotions. So when I look at art and I see something beautiful, I, I, I'm moved in, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may make me happy. It may, you know, be a somber moment. Beauty mm-hmm. takes on a lot of things. When right. I see something that's very complex, and uh, there's a piece of art behind you that someone I know painted it, and, and I asked her about it, and she said, well, it was a really rough time, and I can see that mm-hmm. in the painting. Mm-hmm. So that helps once again, to stir the emotion. So whether they're good or whether it's right. a great emotion or one that we're struggling with, it's still a point of interest, isn't well, it? Well, people have a different uh, take on what you do. Right. Some people go, hooray, I agree with that, or, right. oh, no, I don't agree <laughs> right. with you. But the thing is, is as an artist, you learn to be a lawyer also to defend what you do because it is your opinion that you're sharing. Right, on the, right now, I'm into mosaics. I'm doing mosaics like 
crazy. Right. Um, I'm doing pieces that'll go in my uh, in my garden. I want them to be outdoor pieces, so I'm doing some of those, and they have no political content whatsoever. It is totally <laughs> about the joy of a, of a different medium for me. But um, but I think with art that people need to know that art can be way more important than something to match your sofa. You look at uh, Guernica by Picasso on his outrage of what happened to that little village with Franco and and um, Hitler and bombing that little village. That wasn't a piece to make you go, oh, that would look so nice with my red sofa and my yellow chair. It was it was to bring people aware of his outrage about what had happened. So I think art can be on many different levels. And I encourage my students not to be afraid to express things that they're concerned about. My artwork is pretty much a diary of my life. Like when a family member passes away, I usually do an artwork about that person. Uh, my niece died this past year of breast cancer, and she was a young woman, and she was from Wisconsin. So I've done a snow scene of Wisconsin, and then I bought um, 12 karat gold and started doing little snowflakes in gold uh, to represent her soul. Mm. So sometimes what you do is not going to be real obvious to somebody else, but for you as the artist, you know what your goal is and what you're trying you to putting, achieve. Are you putting your feelings on that canvas? You bet I am. Okay, so you, you're using you're using that canvas, your imagination, mm-hmm. your memories of of your your relative, your friend, and you you are memorializing that forever. So you're you're capturing your feelings in that piece. That's exactly right. And mm. somebody else will see that and they'll say, "Ooh, what a cold." painting of wisconsin you know with the with the gold snowflakes and then my father-in-law was a uh, got a bad deal at a hospital and i put fish hooks on the bottom of his portrait and i put the dead man hand uh cards attached to the hooks because i felt like he was dealt the dead man's hand so sometimes there are things that only I am going to get. Right. But if somebody wants to ask, I'll be happy to tell them what my intent was. So do you, you do you in your mind say, okay, I'm buying my canvas, my supplies. All right, I've spent three or $400. That's what the therapy session would have cost me. I've got it done. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got something created. Is there a little bit well, of that? Well, let me tell you, I get, I, I'm, I get a little bit of trouble with my husband over some right. of the things I do because I've done three pieces on mattresses. My mm. husband is a Vietnam veteran, and he served 20 years in the Army. And sometimes he would have trouble sleeping at night, and I knew he was having bad dreams. So mm. I asked him one day, I said, do you mind if I do a portrait of you? having nightmares about Vietnam and he said no go ahead so I got a double can I've got a double mattress and gessoed it it's my favorite painting I think I've ever done Mm. and I uh I have him asleep on the mattress and I have he was a helicopter pilot I have his uh Huey flying I have the design of north and south Vietnam I have napalm going off on the mattress and Mm. everything and I had it at a show and a man came up to me and he said you sure got that helicopter right. That's exactly the way that helicopter was. And then another man came mm-hmm. up to me and said, how dare you do this portrait of this man at such a horrible time in his life? He said, did you give permission from him to do this painting? I said, heck yeah, it's my husband. And I said, he had no problem mm-hmm. with me doing the." But the problem is, how do you store mattresses? Right. You know, and then I did another one of a World War II veteran that I absolutely loved and adored named Bob Snyder. And mm. Bob was Bob was not well. And so his son helped me put a camera over his bed and had him moving like he's asleep. I did a painting of a bed with just the pillow and the sheets on it. And I had recorded Bob earlier, like, a year earlier on his stories about World War II. The guy was such a great storyteller. So what I did was I projected Bob's image moving on the mattress. Okay, you with me on what I'm talking about now? With his stories being told. And Bob died a month after his son and I filmed him lying Mm. in the bed. So that's a, and I showed it uh, two years ago at the Veterans Day that we had at Whippoorwill Academy and Village for our Veterans Day event that we had for How did people respond? Oh my gosh, they loved it. They were mm. so 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 positive about it. And his, he has a son who is still serving our country, and another one uh, is on our board. And he and his mom both came down for the showing of that. So, I think our our veterans have many many stories that need to be shared. And 
we've done our share of that over the years, and it's not always a pleasant experience. No, it isn't. I would say most of the time it's not. And it's one of those heavier sides of our of our society that I think we're better when we talk about it and and let those I don't if wanna, they can talk about it. That's right. That's right. But when when that happens, when that happens, yeah. I think it's a good thing. It's very it's it's yeah. a difficult journey to to set and <clears throat> paint or or c- document and capture these stories yep. and not be moved by them. Well, my father did not talk about World War II. He right. served in the Navy on a big ship in the Pacific, picked up the folks from the Bataan Death March and that kind of thing. I saw some horrible things, but he never talked about it. But Mm -hmm. the day I introduced him to my husband, I said, if my dad doesn't like you, you'll know it immediately. He's very protective about my sister and me. And so I introduced him to my father and I said, Dad, um, Dick, Martini served in the military. He served in Vietnam, and he and Dad started. Dad started telling him stories he never shared with my sister and me. Mm. And I realized then that they belong to a club that I don't belong to. That's right. It's a it's a private club that uh, unless you served, you don't belong to that club. And uh, and. And as soon as we got ready to leave, my dad said, I really like your young man. You know, so I so was <laughs> right. like, so we walked out in the yard right. and my husband looked at me and says, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, they had that, as you said, that brotherhood yeah. that was there. Your background has uniquely prepared you for the next chapter in Whippoorwill Academy. So for people listening, watching, let's give us a, a good feel for what Whipp- Whippoorwill Academy is. I know, yeah. I know, because I visited your mother. She took me on tours personally, so I know I know that intimate story. But just share what it was and what it is now and where you see it going. Well, honestly, whenever uh, I retired from teaching, I thought that I was going to assist my mother because my mm-hmm. mom, even in her 80s, was a goer woman. Right. And, um, and she knew what her vision was and what she was going to do. And then my mother was diagnosed with cancer and died within a month of having found she had cancer. So the last few weeks I spent with her at the hospital in Winston-Salem, I talked to her about ideas that I had for the village. And she said, go for it, do it, you go for it. But she did warn me. She said, if you do two festivals a year, it will kill you. (laughs) And I didn't listen to her she was absolutely right that uh that it is very is very difficult to do that and we are totally non-profit Mm -hmm. all the people who come and work with us are volunteers nobody gets paid Mm -hmm. and they are such cheerful volunteers and it's we have a it's like a family that we have with whippoorwill well what do people experience when they come to whippoorwill well whippoorwill's total goal is to um is to celebrate local history, to celebrate the art of the local people, and also to celebrate agriculture. So we we hit a lot of spots um, with that. We have everybody. We, Dink Tharp is our blacksmith. He comes and volunteers there. We have several people who work from the uh, from the spinning wheel and drop spindle weaving and the loom. Um, My cousin Renee Frost is one of my right-hand people who's there all the time to help. She demonstrates Appalachian toys. My husband and I, when we have private tours, I love that when we have school kids because my husband and I both are retired educators. And I started reading as much as I could about Daniel Boone. And I thought, I want to do something that the kids won't forget. So I painted a hundred rocks with different animals that Daniel Boone would have hunted. And I learned about what was special about that animal. Like the buffalo was the hump. The bear tongue was sweet. You know, all these different things about the animals. And my grandson and I hid them all over the village. So my husband has a bartering table set up under one of the um, cabins. For bar to teach your kids, there's no money. What are we going to do? Right. You find one rock, and, and we'll do a barter. So the kids, it's like an Easter egg hunt. They can only find one rock. But the most valuable rock is the rock that has a jar of salt painted on it because that was as valuable to the frontier pioneer folks as ammunition. Oh, sure. And so, I mean, you could use a bow and arrow, but 
the salt was what helped preserve your food. So the kids love running and finding their rock, and they <laughs> stand in line to barter, and my husband and I will have toys or candy and pencils, and then they'll have something like a rock and a piece of string. And for some reason, some kids will go for the piece of string, and we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but, uh, but that's one of the things that we do with kids, among other things. We do a lot of things with children. My now, mother... Now, let me ask you about Daniel Boone, because... You have a unique piece of history on your property, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? We have two unique pieces of history. One is um, the Daniel Boone Hunting Lodge uh, is where we have the video. My mother did approximately, I'd say, 10 or to 12 North Carolina videos about history of North Carolina. And I would mm-hmm. love to continue that, but I haven't had time yet. Mm-hmm. But um, but we show that we have chairs set up in the Daniel Boone Hunting Lodge. It's our oldest building, oldest cabin. It was moved from Howard's Knob area in Watauga County. And it's actually... A cabin that Daniel Boone slept in when he went hunting because when they went hunting, they didn't come back that night. Sure, there's a long way to ride your horse up into the mountains, so the hunters would use these log cabins that were all over the place. But this was one that Daniel Boone um, stayed in. My cousin Cam Finley bought that and donated as a, in memory of my father when he passed and, and had it moved to our village and put together, which was so generous of him to do that. So we have that building that's used for educational purposes. Then we have. Um, we have a building that's a replica of Daniel Boone's cabin, and I told you earlier about Dr. Spainauer, his little right. house that I moved when I was crazy and young and bought it for a dollar. But anyway, he was living in the 1800s, and he went to that cabin site and measured it out and saw how that cabin was laid out. So we built, rebuilt this replica according to Dr. Spainauer's specifications. The stones used in this cabin were actual stones from Daniel Boone's chimney. So the fireplace and the chimney are original, honest to gosh, stones that Daniel Boone touched mm-hmm. uh, to put his cabin now, together. There was Daniel Boone, of course, had several cabins. So these rocks came from one of those. That's correct. Okay. He had he had three houses here, or cabins here in Wilkes County. One's under the Kerscott Reservoir now. The mm-hmm. other one was at the mouth of the Beaver Creek, and that one flooded didn't take you long to, to, to right. like, ooh, this is not a good place to right. live. And so then they went across the river to a higher elevation, also in Ferguson, and built the next cabin there. So he was there during the time that my Ferguson ancestors were there. And one of my um, ancestors went over to play with his children one day and got cut on his knife and had a terrible scar for the rest of her life. Wow. But um, but he was... He was a part of our community, even though I'm sure Rebecca, who really deserves the medals for rearing children on her own oh, when sure. he was gone, so, yes. yeah, and teaching the kids how to shoot and everything else. So I think Rebecca is left out sometimes, and she should not be. She right. was an she was a major brave woman. Is the Daniel Boone part of Whipwheel Academy a big draw for you? Is that oh uh, yeah, it sure is. Well, we have two big draws. We have Tom Dooley. My right. mother did a whole series of paintings about uh, the story of Tom Dooley. And so we have a Tom Dooley Museum where we also show a video that my mom had done about Tom Dooley. So those are our two big draws for people to come. But we also like to focus on the one-room schoolhouse, the Whippoorwill Schoolhouse for which the village is named. Because you would think that a one-room schoolhouse, what could a person do with that? Well. One of our historians who sadly passed away this week was Zeltes Walsh. And Zeltes told mm-hmm. me, Margaret, this wasn't just your typical one-room schoolhouse. It was a schoolhouse of higher education. If you had higher aspirations, you went to Whippoorwill Academy and Village. James Larkin Pearson, our state second poet laureate and our longest serving poet laureate attended school there my grandfather who was a writer attended school there his brother who was an engineer on the panama canal went there his sister was a nurse at the panama canal went there i mean there were just some his brother was an engineer was an inventor who was an oil tycoon in dallas got his education there so a lot of people came out of that school who did do some pretty important things with their lives. And that building is on your property. That building is on our property, and we want to change the upstairs into an area to acknowledge all the people who attended that school and what they did with their lives. Uh, as and People say, oh, you can't get a good education today. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you ever more kidding me? Right. The other thing that we're doing on the property 
Captain Lindsay and Sarah Ferguson's home, which is where I grew up, is on the property. And part of it is used for an Airbnb, but the other part we're using for our board meetings. And uh, my board members and I are working. My mother and my grandfather left a Mount Everest of documents, historical papers, photographs, all kinds of stuff from folklore to family histories to Daniel Boone to all sorts of things. We are filing those into uh, binders. And my mother had some of those out in the visitor center. And sadly, some people decided decided to steal those Uh so they would leave the binder and take the contents so some people are trying to help us rebuild those uh, binders on families families i found a whole thing on swanson's i don't know many swanson's my granddaddy had a huge thing about the swanson family so we're Mm -hmm. doing a binder for the swanson's but anyway we want it to be a place where people can come and also do genealogical research sure and from going through this you know we are so spoiled with ancestry.com my grandfather did it all by writing letters and following that track to this person from texas to colorado to you know he it's didn't amazing have that. it's amazing when we look at technology now and think about how easy it is i mean it's yeah. just a few oh, minutes yeah. and you have all sorts of information on people but what do you do with it's the next thing so uh oftentimes not a lot so you're talking about an era which is even strange to even call it an era but a a time in history which there again it's there but a lot of people still do this now a lot of people go to the library Mm -hmm. i see people in uh, historic libraries all the time right because they're there searching they're there making notes they're writing they're they're copying they're 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 getting that uh tactile and environmental experience some stuff that they won't find on ancestry.com do you think it's possible to develop a deep appreciation and an understanding uh, and I just kind of feel the significance of, of our his, of our history without going and getting involved. I can't imagine. I mean, it, it's it's to me, it's such a wonderful experience to go. You know, we have started working on developing a, a Daniel Boone uh, a special and documentary work, and I love. What I'm doing now. I mean, Come I'm going over. to. I've got to step yeah. like this on Daniel Boone <laughs> right. at and, the house. And, and we'll def- <laughs> I definitely will. And, you know, going to Horn in the West and, and not just seeing what they're doing, but understanding why they did it to begin with. Mm-hmm. Here in the Carolinas and all over the country, you know, these, these wonderful outdoor dramas were started. Yes, there's a historical significance, but they were all started to bring in tourism, to tell a Mm -hmm. story of an area, a piece of American heritage and history, and bring people to the area to live it. Not right. to watch it, you know, on right. a film, which is a, which is still a wonderful thing to do. But getting out and doing that, there's a lot of power to that. Well, isn't there? one day somebody's going to get really wise and do a film in Hollywood on Daniel Boone, and I would love to see one on Daniel Boone uh, with Simon Kenton. They're, uh-huh. they're both such interesting people, and they both, Simon Kenton saved him a couple of times, saved sure. his life a couple of times. So I, I think that there's a big hunk of of history that has not been addressed. Fess Parker was a cool guy, but he was way sure. taller than Daniel Boone, and it was a cheesy show. Sorry, whoever right. developed that. But but Daniel Boone was so much more than that. And, um, and I try to... Um, what we do when we have school groups, depending on the numbers, there might be four groups, there might be three, and they, sure. the bell rings, it's time to go to the next. So we don't, we can't get 90 kids in one building. So we have to divvy them up. But I get so excited talking about Daniel Boone that I need more time. But, you know, <laughs> but there's, but we have to squeeze as much as we can. So in let's a talk about, time. let's talk about this. This, this is curious to me. So the, the children that you're talking, how, what are, what's their age group? We have them from kindergarten up, usually okay. not high school, and I understand why. Mm-hmm. When you have high school and they're missing other classes, those teachers get really angry. Sure. And from having taught high school for a long time, I you get it. I experienced that. Right. right. <laughs> so I understand why, but it doesn't mean that we can't do something after school for kids who could could come to those kind of things. Okay. But, so, let, so that's what I want to talk about. T- tell us about the or share with us if you would the experience that these young kids are having 
are they are they really excited about learning about Daniel Boone in this part of history? So my question is, are they excited now? And have you noticed or seen a change since when your mother started this? Or is it the same? Is the same amazement there? I think the amazement is there, first of all, You probably remember from being a student that the things that stand out most in your mind were your field trips that you got to take. And I always let the kids know, please, please thank your teachers. Our teachers are so underpaid in North Carolina and underappreciated. You make sure that that teacher knows how much you appreciate them going to the trouble to plan this trip for you. So they, we like different ones depending on which schedule they get. You know, like I'll start out with the church with my group, for example, and we'll learn about early churches and the boys sit on one side and the girls sit on the mm-hmm. other and I have the nodding stick to whack them in the head if they <laughs> right, go to right. sleep and that kind of thing but right. but they um, but they're so sweet but one of the things that my mother used to do which I thought was a great idea we have flush toilets but we also have our houses mm. I do not want the kids to use a flush toilet until they've experienced an outhouse. And I want them to, be, and sometimes that's the biggest thing that they remember. You won't believe how people used to go to the bathroom. <laughs> right, right. You know, so I think that the whole thing is learning about another time period. And my cousin Renee, who does the, um, the one room schoolhouse, she has different things on the desks. And she said, what is that on your desk? And the kid will pick up the corn cob and said, oh, it's a it's a corn cob. And she goes, no, that's your toilet paper for today. You know, they go, oh, <laughs> by the way, anybody who donates to the village, we're nonprofit. It's tax deductible. But my before my mom died, she said, I have one wish. And, and she said, I wish that that we would get a barn at the village so that you could do workshops and dances mm-hmm. and wedding receptions right. and that kind of thing. And I knew that um, to buy a barn, an old barn was going to be so expensive. Well, we were blessed. A family in uh, in Caldwell County, the Story family, gave us a beautiful old barn. And there was an old shed that was used as an old family garage in the early 1900s that was going to be an art classroom building. Wow. So we so we had the money to get it dismantled and moved, but now we don't have the money to put it back together again. Uh, so that's so going to be the next the next stage. The next our next big project and some people say aren't you worried about this? Isn't this just a burden on your shoulders to try and figure this out? And I said, "No, it isn't." I said, "We have been so lucky. <laughs> you know, people have been so kind and so generous to us. No, I'm not worried about it. Things will fall into place and that barn will get put together and that little art shed will get put together and uh, I would love to have an old fashioned barn raising but I don't know how to do it but um, someone said you need to contact the Amish community they know all about that so that's Mm -hmm. that's one of the directions I'm going to take to see if they can give me some advice on what to do well that'll be an interesting story to follow it will you'll have to come i've got people who said they'll do the food for all the workers so right. i've already got the food lined up and yeah. then i've got a lot of people that said they'd be willing to help so an old-fashioned barn raising tim what do you think of that i love it yeah. tim you tim you open to helping us on that one count me in you, 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 you sound like a jack of all trades i love that idea <laughs> uh. I've got to give my husband a plug. Right. I could not do anything without my right hand man, right. and he is a. Or he says together we make a whole person. <laughs> and, um, but he, uh, but right. he's he's very left brain and very logical and methodical about things. He says he keeps one of my legs uh, tied to the earth so I don't float away. Um, but <laughs> nice. he. He is there every day doing work. We've got a lot of rotted wood on some of the buildings that have to be replaced. And again, that costs money. So we're hoping for donations to come in that right. we can afford to do that. But we also do other community things. We had a food drive a few weeks ago for um, the Samaritan's Kitchen here in Wilkes County. And we got a huge load of food and also donations of money that people gave us to, to give to them. So, so that's always part of your, your process. So you're educated and you have to deal with the business side of things, which is always uh, a challenge, but it's just part of, part of the process. Yeah. Let's talk for a moment, Margaret, about the scope of not just Whippoorwill Academy, but places that are doing similar work why are the living farms these living experiences why are they so important for the human experience i personally learn more from doing and seeing Mm -hmm. than sitting down to a lecture 
And I think that's where these places come into play. Uh, I go to, Dick and I, uh, a couple of years ago, followed the, the path of Daniel Boone up through Kentucky and then into Missouri. And it even gave me a greater appreciation of where he traveled on horseback, for crying out loud. Right. You know, and then the, all the different problems that he faced. Uh, so I think that seeing and hands-on learning is just, there's just no... There's nothing else that could take that place that, uh, not that you can't learn a lot in a classroom. I hope my students did from, from things that I sure. told them about art history that didn't put them to sleep. But, but whenever you get to go to a place and actually be involved with the place and see the place, I think it takes on a greater meaning. If I can encapsulate the experience that I had on my, or that I have had in, in several visits to your academy, it's been uh, that visual the visual, the smell, I say the smell because the blacksmith would be going, there would be a fire, there'd be someone cooking. And then the sounds also, the music of that mm-hmm. time. To me, having all of those things from a sensory standpoint going on helped me understand the stories even better. Oh, yeah. And I feel like for me as a former educator, which I feel like I'm still educating, but as a director of the village, I want to encourage people with those talents mm. to continue. Like Mary Bolin and Melissa Williams are our hearth cookers. And we have Jim Jordan, who's so knowledgeable about um, Native Americans. Encourage everybody with what they're doing uh, that it's not for naught. You mm. are doing something so important. Keep on with what you're doing. One of my former students was there this past weekend who's a professional musician on pump organ. And he was there playing in his time period clothing in the chapel for people to hear what a pump organ sounds like. I mean, there's just, I think encouragement is so important in all of this and appreciation. I never want anybody who comes and volunteers at our village not to feel like that they were appreciated because we do appreciate them. And I think that would be one of the worst things to think that I gave a day of my time and nobody even cared. I don't want anybody to ever leave with that. If I could rent Porta Johns for free and I could not be uh, obliged to pay pay taxes or, you know, utilities, I would be happy to do everything free. But I don't think people understand how expensive it is to run this village and to maintain it. Um, And that any the ten dollars that they give at the door goes toward it doesn't go toward me going to las vegas and gambling at the slot machines it goes right. toward maintaining this place and keeping it so that we can continue using it well i don't think you have i don't think you have apologies to make for that because there's certainly that quality experience that people are having when they're there and uh it's just part of i think when we travel we're we often you know if i go to old salem you know right. I, I buy a ticket if i uh there are there are places that you can go that you don't have to do that but then you have days that people can go and they don't have to that's pay. right so you've got a combination of all those things going on well the big thing is it's there the mm-hmm. big thing is people can have this experience and help and help feel a bit of what it would have been like. Mm -hmm. I like to use that term, and sometimes I think it's lazy, but when we say back in the day, uh, on the journey that we're on now, as far as working on uh, content for our TV program, our documentary work, we've been spending a lot of time in history, getting to know our founding fathers, getting to know Daniel Boone. I feel like Tom Dooley was a little bit easier for us uh, many years ago because that his story was so uh, brought to life uh, Mm -hmm. in a very interesting way by people within a certain region of the Carolinas. But the thing that I have become profoundly amazed by, Margaret, is the fact that this just hasn't been that long ago. We recently had uh, a lady pass away who was the last recipient of a Civil War benefit, Mm -hmm. which is amazing a about Ferguson it. lady, no doubt. Yep. <laughs> it must be in the water. <laughs> what are your What are your people? Yeah, I interviewed uh, I don't know five or six years ago a doctor in South Carolina. He and his brother had delivered thousands of babies, but his father was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. I talked to uh, a Cherokee elder, and I asked her. She was part of the Great Removal, and I asked her to share with me, 
you know, I didn't ask her how she felt about it. I can only imagine. But mm-hmm. I did ask her to uh, explain to me uh, how she deals with those thoughts and that process. Mm-hmm. And, and, and she said, well, I don't like it. And she says, my grandmother was on the grave removal and she died. And, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm talking to a person yep. that, that knew someone Granted, she was older, but and the girl was young at the time, but she knew someone who was on that trail. And it's remarkable that this, all of these things, uh, things we, we talk about, racial issues, all of these things we talk about, the past has not been that far. You are absolutely right. My mother's grandfather was a Confederate officer Mm. and my aunt my mother's old sister just passed away a few days ago and there's a photograph of her with her uncle jesse ferguson who was with lee at appomattox and walked home back to wilkes county to become sheriff here at some point Mm. carrying one memento the cannonball a civil war cannonball so which we still have but that's my aunt with her picture with her with her uncle do you think that it that it is logical that uh, we get past our, our feelings and our prejudice, prejudices, you know, just, you know, say, okay, we're going to do it. We're no longer this. We're no longer that. Considering the fact that we haven't been removed that far. And so a lot of the feelings and emotions and, and family stories are tied to real experiences. It wasn't mm-hmm. that people were necessarily bad people. They weren't. I talked to people who were wonderful people, done great things, but there is a piece, you know. Uh, if you if you if you don't support the notion of war and defending our nation, then you would have a lot of problem with a lot of people. If you you don't like this, you don't like that, then you have a problem with a lot of people. But it's it's the human experience that we're right. all talking about, right? Well, a cousin of mine recently posted on Facebook. Uh, her her grandfather was Will Ferguson, my grandfather's older brother. And um, she posted a letter that he had written about the difficulties of the Ferguson family during the Reconstruction era following the Civil War Mm -hmm. and how hard that was because my grandfather, my great grandfather, Lindsay, had 11 children. And he spoke about the fact that they made sure that all of those children got a college education. um, Wow. And it meant paying for things with butter and eggs and milk, but all of the kids were college educated or at a technical school. And he said, you know, he had the greatest respect for his parents, knowing what difficulties there were at that time and how poor the South was and how this area struggled following the Civil War and the Reconstruction sure. era, that his parents would still see the the need for their children to be educated. And it was a very, very complicated time. I mean, so that was complicated. The Revolutionary War was complicated. Yeah, absolutely. So these were very dramatic times for people. But my gosh, Margaret, a lot of people survived. Well, some, a cousin asked me recently, Margaret, why do you think the Ferguson brothers didn't go fight at the Battle of Kings Mountain? Mm because they walked right past their farm. And I said, this is my thought about it. I feel that Patrick Ferguson was a relative. Ah. (laughs) And I feel that Uh, they were not going to go fight against a family member. Mm. And also, their land was probably um, granted to them by the king if they didn't Mm. pick up arms against the the crown. So I said, that that may be. Then again, on the other side of my family, I had a female great-great-grandmother who was loading guns and making ammunition for the Over Mountain Victory Man. (laughs) So every, every aspect of people's families is different. But... I don't hold that against them if that was the case. I don't know, but that would be my guess as to why they did It certainly would be a theory, right? Yeah. Let me tell you something. A woman said to me recently, I don't see the point of history. What was, was. Leave it alone. It's in the past. Leave it alone. And I wanted to say to her, I'd love to go back to her and say, you know, if we look at this pandemic that we're having right now, and we and I read a huge book on the pandemic of 1918, we would learn so much looking back in history on how that was handled as to how we should handle it now. There is an importance to history. We can learn from long ago and to what to do now. So I think that history, another aspect of history is that 
learn from that past and how can we apply it now to make things better now? Well, I think that's that's the notion, isn't it? If we don't learn from it, we're destined to repeat exactly, it. Exactly, right? exactly. We keep going through these processes. I One of the great things that, that I like to think about when we look at Whippoorwill Academy and, and the Living History Museums are around the country and specifically here in the Carolinas is how much we can learn from the goodness of that time. Mm-hmm. Isn't there a great power in nostalgia? Just that, just the, that so. just the notion of nostalgia, not even really knowing why I feel so good and relaxed about being here, <laughs> but I do. What well, is it? Well, I'm going to tell you, I restored the house that my fifth great grandfather built in 1832. It's all mm. handmade brick. My dad used it as a barn. The floors were caved in. The walls you could push back and forth. (laughs) But I have the same view as my ancestors. And I feel so nostalgic about that, that I wish that they could tell me stories. You know, there are letters. We have letters from the 1800s from them that -hmm. that I learned something about about my Hagler relatives. They were uh, from Switzerland, and my grandmother on the other side of my family said they were considered Quar. And I asked her (laughs) why, and she said because everybody else was Scottish or Irish, and they had uh, different farming practices than those uh, neighbors around them, so they were Quar. But uh, but (laughs) I enjoy my Quar ancestors' view, and I enjoy living in their house and uh, and knowing that um, that I'm in the same walls that so many other that they went through so much from 1832 you know what what all did they experience what hardships did they have mm. so I'm I don't take that for granted not at all not for a minute and my husband feels the same way even though it's not his family per se he feels the same way that it's it's a it's an honor to, to be in this space. And again, we're stewards. Right. You know, we're just maintaining. So you're there. You're there, Margaret. You're there. You're painting. You're painting and you're, 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 you're looking for or feeling for or waiting for your muse, your inspiration. So while you're in that house or that place where you're painting, surrounded by this history, do you ever get the sensation that you get this tap on the shoulder, the whisper, we'll paint about this, Margaret? My mother did an etching back in, oh gosh, what year was it? Maybe the early 1980s of the house and the fifth great grandmother, Elizabeth Van Hoos, who married the, the, the Hagler. And she has her... She has her as a ghost, and she had me in the picture. And my mom said, "Sometimes I think you are the reincarnate of the of the ancestor," which I thought was kind of cool because my mother my mother didn't put anything as no way, no how. You know, like there's all sorts of possibilities. We don't know the answers to everything. When my mother was living, she had the farm put on the North Carolina Birding Trail, ah. and she did paintings of North Carolina birds and attached them to all of the cabins. So I'll have a contest with the kids. I'll divide them up into groups right. and give them. They have to go to the building. Each building has a n- number painted on a rock. Who can come back before the bell rings with the most? Uh, mm. birds that they've discovered. So that's that's been a neat thing to do. So that's interesting from that standpoint. But on your property, do you have vegetation, things that are uh, attractive to birds and animals? Is that part of what you do as well? We've got, we've got um, the forest nearby. In fact, there's this lovely couple who are from Ferguson who mm-hmm. have agreed to help us make a, uh, a hiking trail that'll go down to the Edkin River and back. And what I would love to do with that is also make it a poetry trail that we can put poetry in by local students oh, uh, that they can read along the trail and back. But the kudzu is a problem. So that's something that we're tackling as many other people are. Uh, with you the, know, they say you can make jelly out of that. So I don't my know. My cousin Lynn used to do that, but we've got the bamboo and we're doing bamboo pickles. Bamboo um, pickles. My grandmother Ferguson created the recipe back in the 19... 19- I should have brought you a jar. Are they good? Is it good? Oh my I, gosh, yes, they're delicious. What does it taste like? It's, it tastes like a dill... It's different than a dill pickle. Uh, I make them hot and I make them regular. We have right. Grandma's picture with her bamboo on the label of our bamboo pickles, but we sold out last year. I mean, with right. they just they sell so fast. But uh, but you can only I made all the bamboo I was going to make. I made like ninety jars of bamboo, and I thought I'm done. Right. But uh, we have them for sale at Matt's store. 
Okay. But uh, but grandmother got, I don't know, do you remember the Betty Feaser show? I do. I do. My grandmother's glorious day was when Betty Feaser chose her bamboo pickle recipe and featured it on her show. <laughs> Grandmother was more proud of that than of her grandchildren, I'm sure. Uh, but the boy cousins loved to finish eating the pickles and then see who could drink the vinegar. You know, so it was like the, <laughs> the contest with the, the boy cousins. Well, I tell you what, next time we're together, you bring uh, bamboo pickles. I'll find another uh, oddity to bring, and and we'll, we'll taste uh, we'll taste some heritage. How's that? Well, I got a call from a Japanese company last right. year that wanted to do. They have their own uh, PBS show in Japan, and they mm-hmm. wanted to do a story on Grandma's bamboo pickles. But I didn't hear from huh? them after that, so the, the guy must have nixed it. So that who 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 wants to hear about bamboo pickles but right. but uh but anyway it's it's something that is a tradition every year in memory nice. of grandma we make those bamboo pickles nice well those are great things well margaret it's been really wonderful to spend some time with you getting to know a bit about your history talking about your mom and whippoorwill academy and and its impact on education young lives and older lives too that's yeah. a, that's an awfully special thing well we love having senior groups there and and in fact, I have probably as much fun with the senior, like the church groups come from everywhere um, there. But I want to say one last thing that is always mm-hmm. surprising to me is how few people in Wilkes County know that we even exist. Mm-hmm. But people, we have a guy from Denmark who comes almost every year to Whippoorwill. He loves Whippoorwill. Right. So that always amazes me. But I guess it's like people from North Carolina who don't know about the Biltmore House. You know, that always surprises me. Or know, or, or know about it. They, they've heard they just haven't been there. Or Grandfather Mountain. Where's sure. that? Sure. You know, so I always think it's a good thing for people to explore their own area as yeah. well. Get out and have a good time. You don't even have to have a passport. You know? <laughs> no, so there you, you go. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, have a car or get in a friend's car and, and, and go ride around. Well, that's what it's all about, life in the Carolinas. Yeah. We love discovering the interesting places that we have and the people who help bring them to life because our places aren't anything without our people. That's right. Bring a picnic and come on out. Yeah, there you go. So, All right. It's sounds nice, great. nice talking with you. It's great talking to you, Margaret. Thank you. Well, folks, there you have it. We had another wonderful visit with a Carolina person doing something wonderful for not only folks in the Carolinas, but anyone who wants to make their way to the Carolinas and enjoy some of our wonderful heritage, heritage and traditions, right? That's correct. Lip Will Academy. Margaret, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And folks who are interested can look on for our website, and also we're on Facebook. Your website is? Is www.whipperwillacademy.com. Dot com. And if you hurry, you can get you some of those pickled what? Bamboo. Pickled <laughs> bamboo. Thanks for listening to the Life in the Carolinas podcast. If you enjoyed your time with us, please visit the show's website at lifeinthecarolinas.com. Join our mailing list and we'll keep you updated every week on what we have coming up and other interesting things around the Carolinas. We value you as a podcast subscriber. We'll see you next week. And remember what Carl says, it's never a bad time for a good story.